Atoms are the basic unit of chemical elements. They contain subatomic particles in their nucleus and in the electron cloud that surrounds the nucleus. These subatomic particles include protons and neutrons, which are located in the nucleus, and electrons, which are located in the cloud or field that surrounds the nucleus. Protons have a positive electrical charge, neutrons are uncharged, and electrons have a negative charge. The number of protons and electrons are equal, so atoms are electrically neutral particles. Atoms are the basic building blocks of all matter. They're extremely small, make up everything in our universe. Stars, these bananas, our entire body. All made of tiny atoms fit together differently. Atoms are made up of three particles called Electrons, protons, and neutrons Electrons are the smallest, their charge is negative Spinning really fast all around the nucleus The protons positive and located in the center Form in the nucleus with neutrons that have no charge And are when particles amass different Makes various elements One proton, one electron, the simplest atom's hydrogen Every element has its own atomic number Tells us how many protons located in its center Less protons means less mass Like hydrogen that's a gas It's less dense in the air One proton in the nucleus Because protons have a strong positive charge Push each other away But pull back with a strong nuclear force Balance makes atoms possible Everything in the universe Different atoms clump together Are known as molecules And the atom is made up of three elementary particles. Protons, which have a positive electrical charge. Electrons, which have a negative electrical charge. And neutrons, which have no charge. Protons and neutrons are packed into the nucleus, while electrons spin around outside. It's simply astounding to me that atoms are mostly empty space. And as the city we experience around us is an illusion. So in a quick recap, we have an atom made of three elementary particles. Protons and neutrons packed tightly in the center. We call that a nucleus. And then we have the electrons, which are the ones that are orbiting around the outside. Each of these three particles have three distinct electrical charges. The proton packed in the middle has a positive charge and you can remember that by saying proton, positive, both of them start with the letter P. The other particle in the middle called a neutron, they have no charge like neutral, neutral, neutron, you remember that. The last particle is the electron and those are the ones orbiting around the outside of the middle and those have a negative electrical charge. Welcome to our understanding of the size of the atom. Here you're looking at a collection of objects or places of which you might be familiar. As we zoom in, you'll notice approaching us in the upper right corner is Central Park. As we zoom in a little further, we notice we're approaching the circumference of 1,000 meters, in which we have the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Statue of Liberty, the Eiffel Tower, the Titanic, the average football field. As we zoom in just a bit closer, we have a standard aircraft, Boeing 747, the blue whale, and the oak tree. As we continue to zoom in further, we're approaching life forms that are familiar to us. We have an elephant, 
giraffe and approaching even further with human beings. If we continue past our frame of reference for size, we encroach upon the one meter circumference in which we have the average shrew, a Russell's teapot, and an egg. We continue to zoom in further and we find ourselves in a smaller realm. Up on the left you'll notice the US penny, to the bottom of our frame the coffee bean, and a glass marble to the right. Upon closer investigation, we are approaching items that are very, very small. You'll notice up at the right-hand corner, a grain of rice. At the top, you have a single bead of sleet. And at the bottom, our standard ant. Zooming in even farther, we are approaching things that are almost beyond our ability to see. To the right, you'll notice a grain of salt and a grain of sand. To the left, you will notice the strand of the largest recorded bacteria. As we zoom in even farther beyond a millimeter of circumference, we approach organisms that we can't see without a microscope. We also approach the width of a human hair. At the bottom right, you will notice a gray circle denoted the smallest object visible to the naked eye. Beyond this point, as we zoom in, all objects or organisms shall require a microscope of amazing magnitude for us to be able to see them. On the right upper corner approaching, we see a skin cell. And as we continue, we find the cell nucleus at the bottom, a white blood cell that aids in the fighting of virus and bacteria to the left. The top we have the chloroplast, which is a feature of the plant cell. We have blood cells and other parts that make us who we are. As we're approaching the one micrometer circumference, we are seeing our first signs of large viral bodies and violet light wavelengths. Approaching the inner circle of the micrometer, we have a circle at the top noted the smallest thing visible to an optical microscope. We are now approaching the limit of our technology as we see viruses appearing at the bottom like HIV, porcine, hepatitis, and now you see approaching the frame DNA, the makeup of who we are. Beyond DNA approaching us are things that have probably been foreign to your imagination until now. Some things, admittedly, even I don't understand. To the bottom right, you have a glucose molecule, which is a very tiny, tiny arrangement of sugars. Now approaching the one nanometer circumference, which is 10 to the negative ninth power, very, very, very many zeros, we find ourselves entering the world of the atom. Atoms are so small that they must be measured by an angstrom, a unit of measurement not used in normal life. And here we get our first glimpse of familiar atoms, hydrogen on the left and helium on the right. We are now at a level of examination unable to be carried out by the human eye or even by our modern 
instruments. It takes a very highly specialized and very expensive instrument to view the atom. And as we rewind, you'll see just how far we've come. Quick recap, atoms are really small. Smaller than this piece of hair. Smaller than anything that we can see with our own naked eyes. Very small. The picnic near the lakeside in Chicago is the start of a lazy afternoon, early one October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now every 10 seconds, we will look from 10 times farther away, and our field of view will be 10 times wider. the alternation between great activity and relative inactivity, a rhythm that will continue all the way into our next goal, a proton in the nucleus of a carbon atom beneath the skin on the hand of the sleeping man at the picnic. We are back at our starting point. We slow up at one meter, 10 to the zero power. Now we reduce the distance to our final destination by 90% every 10 seconds each step much smaller than the one before. At 10 to the minus two, one one hundredth of a meter, one centimeter, we approach the surface of the hand. In a few seconds, we'll be entering the skin, crossing layer after layer from the outermost dead cells into a tiny blood vessel within. Skin layers vanish in turn, an outer layer of cells, felty collagen. The capillary containing red blood cells and a roughly lymphocyte. We enter the white cell. Among its vital organelles, the porous wall of the cell nucleus appears. The nucleus within holds the heredity of the man in the coiled coils of DNA. As we close in, we come to the double helix itself a molecule like a long twisted ladder whose rungs of paired bases spell out twice in an alphabet of four letters the words of the powerful genetic message. At the atomic scale, the interplay of form and motion becomes more visible. We focus on one commonplace group of three hydrogen atoms bonded by electrical forces to a carbon atom. Four electrons make up the outer shell of the carbon itself. They appear in quantum motion as a swarm of shimmering points. At 10 to the minus 10 meters, one angstrom, we find ourselves right among those outer electrons. Now we come upon the two inner electrons held in a tighter swarm. As we draw toward the atom's attracting center, we enter upon a vast inner space. At last, the carbon nucleus, so massive and so small, this carbon nucleus is made up of six protons and six neutrons. We are in the domain of universal modules. There are protons and neutrons in every nucleus, electrons in every atom, atoms bonded into every molecule out to the farthest galaxy. As a single proton fills our scene, we reach the edge of present understanding. Are these some quarks in intense interaction? Our journey has taken us through 40 powers of 10. If now the field is one unit, then when we saw many clusters of galaxies together, it was 10 to the 40th, or one and 40 zeros. 
quick recap. Even our skin is made of atoms. Everything's made of atoms. And when you zoom in with those really expensive microscopes, because we can't use our eyes, they're not powerful enough, you'll see that there's a lot of motion going on within the center of the atom. It looks chaotic. It's almost like it's tensing. This is known as nuclear fission. These large atoms are very unstable. One can be split up by firing a neutron at them. They split into smaller atoms and a number of neutrons. If we measure the mass of the initial atom, and the total mass of the products after the split, there seems to be a discrepancy. Some mass seems to be lost. Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, shows that this incredibly small amount of lost mass is converted into a huge amount of heat energy. So we know each atom splitting up gives off some heat energy. But it gets really exciting when you put a bunch of these atoms together. As one atom splits up, it releases some energetic neutrons, ready to split up some more atoms, which in turn releases more energetic neutrons, which will split up some more atoms, and on and on. This is known as a chain reaction. The problem is, if we don't control this reaction, we soon end up with an incredible amount of heat energy, which is impossible to control resulting in what is known as a nuclear meltdown, which isn't very useful when trying to run a power station. So what you're looking at is what's called a nuclear fuel pool. These pools of cool water exist all over the world and they're where all of the countries store their spent nuclear waste. So at the bottom of these pools are a bunch of uranium atoms that are itching to explode and cause a chain reaction. So in order to keep things from exploding, we have to store them in these cool water pools. In order to best understand how this works, uh, we're gonna have to go down inside of one. So uh, I'll do what I gotta do. This system has just been refueled. It is powered by fuel rods that contain uranium, which is a natural element that is mined from deep in the ground. We keep it here, inside these metal rods. Let's take a look inside. The system is about to be switched back on. To see how uranium makes energy, we'll need to get smaller though. Now we're shrinking to an atomic level. Here, right in front of you, there's rows and rows of uranium pellets in total, there are over 2 million fuel pellets in the whole reactor. And it's inside these pellets, each only a centimetre tall, that nuclear fission happens. Let's get even closer. At this scale, we can see actual atoms and neutrons. Neutrons are the particles that help us unlock all that energy from the nucleus. But they move fast, so first we need to slow one down. And to do that, we simply use water. Let's follow this one and see where it leads us. Pay close attention. Firing this neutron into the nucleus of the atom causes the nucleus to split in two. This is the fission we mentioned earlier. And as the nucleus splits, it releases its own neutrons. Some of these newly released neutrons, slowed by the water, hit other atoms, causing more fission. And so the chain reaction begins. In our reactor, there are an incredible 5 million million fissions per pellet per second. Look around you, and you'll see them happening everywhere. Each time a uranium nucleus splits, it releases its awesome energy. This... Woo! Sorry, y'all, I had to get out of there real quick, because as you saw, that thing was gonna blow, because one of those neutrons escaped from one of those atoms split the nucleus of an atom next door and then boop, 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 chain reaction, whole thing blows, Chernobyl, we're all going down. We're all going down. Very dangerous.
Based on this new phenomenon, it is conceivable, though much less certain, that an extremely powerful bomb of a new type may be constructed. A, a single, single bomb of this type, carried by boat and exploded in a port, might very well destroy the whole port together with some of the surrounding territory. Good God. I don't need to tell you what could happen if the Germans develop this technology before we do. We'll all be doing the Gusta. Or worse, which is why I'm asking you to take charge of a program to research and develop an atomic weapon. It'd require tremendous resources. Of that, I have no doubt. I need wide latitude to manage the project. The scientists, the military, clandestine operations. Secrecy would be vital, sir. We couldn't let the crowds get on to us. Everyone involved will need security clearance. Oppenheimer, Teller, Fermi, Einstein. <laughs> no. No, Einstein, he's out. You haven't even run his background, Edgar. The Bureau has been concerned about Einstein for years. He's a radical, well, certainly a communist. He's the man who informed the president of the urgency of this matter. He cannot be trusted to be loyal to our country. I will, I will support, support and, and defend, defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law. That I, that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law. I saw an aircraft, like a tiny silver drop, entering the sky above Hiroshima. I instantly recognized it as an American plane, as no Japanese aircraft could fly at that altitude at the time. It was just one plane, so I assumed that it was passing by as usual. And I was counting. Ichi ni san. I was wiping the desktop. That was when the bomb was dropped. took about 45 seconds from the time the bomb left the airplane until it exploded. And I think there wasn't a man in the airplane that wasn't either timing it with his watch or counting or doing something. I was sure the bomb was a dud. I was sure it wasn't gonna work. After falling for 43 seconds, the time and barometric triggers started the firing mechanism. A uranium bullet fired down a barrel into a uranium target. Together, they started a nuclear chain reaction. Solid matter began to come apart, releasing untold quantities of energy.
When we discover something, we are harnessing that power, that power of knowledge to make things like this. We have to make sure that that knowledge stays in the hands of people who have everyone's best interests at heart. Everyone, including the whole world. And that's the Adam in a nutshell.